Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, John Seal, and this is the Holistic Nutrition Hub Podcast, the show where we discuss all the important topics that will help you succeed in the nutrition industry. So in this week's special episode, Lynn takes the lead and interviews Stephanie DiGiovanni. Uh, she's the product developer at Coast Protein, and they talk about how cricket protein fits into a system of sustainable food supply. Stephanie is a holistic nutritionist who is absolutely passionate about creative cooking and nutrition. She devotes her time to experimenting with insect protein, growing fermented foods, and learning Italian. So in this interview, Stephanie and Lynn discuss Stephanie's background as a holistic nutrition practitioner. They discuss what allergies cricket protein might be problematic for. Uh, they talk about the nutritional benefits of cricket protein, where coast proteins crickets are farmed and sourced from, and much more. Guys, this was a fantastic episode with lots of laughs and good vibes, so make sure you listen through to the end. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and support us by giving us a five-star review. Enjoy the episode, guys. I just wanted to start off with introducing Stephanie, who is a holistic nutritionist and product developer with Coast Protein. I'm super excited to have her on tonight to talk about uh, cricket protein and what they're doing in the sphere of sustainability. Thanks for coming on, Stephanie. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. All right. So do you want to just start off um, explaining to everybody what your story as a holistic nutritionist has been and how you arrived at making products out of crickets? Sure. Yeah. So um, I attended the Institute of Holistic Nutrition a few years back and I had done that after I had studied um, psychology and throughout my whole undergrad, I always had wanted to know more and was educating myself on health and fitness. And those two kind of just always came hand in hand. And it wasn't until after I graduated that I really realized I should have <laughs> probably made that swap uh, a few years prior, but I ended up um, studying nutrition again, because it was something that I thought was very important in my life. And I wanted to be able to, um, you know, carry that on and be, do something that I was passionate about. So I ended up, um, finishing that program. And during that program, I actually was competing in my first bodybuilding competition. So I was very hyper aware of all my macronutrients and what I needed. Um, because, and like many, many other students who go through this program, I think are very sensitive and, um, you know, psychoanalyze everything and especially like the ingredients and the foods and what's in it. So I felt like I was just living and breathing in health and fitness and what I found was really challenging was finding foods that fit the holistic approach, but also met my needs in terms of um, for my athletic, um, my athletic needs, essentially. So I would make my own products here and there. Um, and oftentimes I was using different ingredients. Right now it's really easy to find like lacuma and maca and whatnot, whatnot. But back then it wasn't. And it de there definitely wasn't a lot of protein bars out there that – um, weren't your basic kind of bodybuilder sort of bars. I had like 25 different ingredients or whatnot. Right. So I was just like making my own like protein pancakes or waffles and whatnot. And at the time, Dylan had just finished studying um, sustainability overseas and also was just noticing that there's so many um, different cultures that you see edible insects on the menus and in the markets. And it was just a normal thing. And after he did his own kind of digging and after reading a lot of artic articles and like the UN had some out about um, basically how edible insects could impact, possibly Im impact uh, food security, food and feed security. So right. he kind of just asked me, you know, hey Steph, like, what do you think about this? Like using crickets as a protein source. I'm like, and I really didn't have much hesitation because I knew that there has to be alternatives out there than what we're currently using. And for, he was lactose intolerant. I was not dealing very well with like all the plant-based um, proteins out there, especially pea protein was really popular at the time mm -hmm. Just, like, for digestive reasons was not really jiving jib with me. So I kind of just jumped on board and applied the experience that I had just like personally in the kitchen by swapping things out of recipes and using kind of random um, ingredients. And one thing kind of led to the, the other. And I just started part-time kind of tinkering to full-time. <laughs> so now I am the product developer of Coast Protein. And um, yeah, we have three products out, three bars and three protein powders. 
Amazing. And mm-hmm. so where do you guys see this going from here? I mean, I've tasted the products and they're amazing. Um, Thank you. Where do you guys see this going from here in the terms of like, you guys have this amazing product, um, but I guess what is like the foundation? Um, I guess sustainability is the foundation of what you guys are trying to achieve here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Well, there's a lot of, so crickets are very sustainable and nutritious. Um, but what we want to do is try to, um, bring the idea of edible insects into the North American diet, because we really are the only culture that doesn't eat them. Um, and we want to normalize that, you know, you know, it's not weird to eat bugs. It can be added into your diet and through that, you know, taking away, um, some of the other, sources of food that we're getting that are harmful. Um, so it does tie into sustainability, of course, you know, right. we're not saying to like eliminate all meat, uh, or, or anything of that sort, but just by, um, swapping different items out and, um, variety, I think we could really help the food security systems. Okay, cool. Uh, What I wanted to ask is, so you said you were having a hard time digesting a lot of the plant proteins. Um, Is there any concerns for anybody else who may have allergies um, in terms of cricket protein? Um, There is a loose link of if you have a shellfish allergy, you may also um, be allergic to crickets just because they're kind of in the same realm, which makes, which makes sense. Like they have an exoskeleton, they have the chitin and whatnot. Um, I haven't heard of anybody that a case where that's actually happened. It's kind of just like a warning sort of thing. Um, most people, it seems to be really easily digestible. A lot of people who do have digestive troubles seem to really thrive on it and really like that for that reason. There's, there's a ton of people who are lactose intolerant and can't handle um, a lot of the other common protein powders. And because we use a blend of pumpkin seed protein and brown rice, um, there doesn't seem to be any problem. So there's, other than that, um, the one allergy for shellfish, there's nothing really else most people should be concerned about. Okay. So you guys do mix your product with some vegetable protein products as well then? Yes, we do. Okay. We kind of amp up the protein content in total. And, um, yeah, cricket definitely has its own flavor profile, and it's not um, not bad by any means, but it is complement. It's complemented by other flavors as well. So we just find like the pumpkin is really nice, or the brown rice. Um, you know, I'd love to kind of get to a point where we have a mainly cricket flour um, protein powder. But at this time, you know, pro- the cricket itself is one of the most expensive ingredients. So we, there's a lot of kind of moving parts in there. Um, but we're really happy with the products that we have now and especially the powders. Um, when I when I developed them, I really wanted to be the most natural tasting and not kind of like this overpowering kind of fake vanilla or chocolate. You know, sometimes you kind of get that weird milk chocolate. Yeah, or, like the, the super chocolatey chocolate or like – Yeah. So yeah. I tried um, really hard to steer away from that. So I'm, I'm really proud of them. And uh, we've gotten – we've received a lot of positive feedback. So – it's been good. So far, so good. Well, Sean and I are firm believers in the cricket protein. Um, mm-hmm. I, as I mentioned to you off the podcast, the first mm-hmm. time that I tried cricket protein was like, um, I don't know, I just had to like stick it in my mouth and just like taste it and be like, that's not bad. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> it's such a, I don't know, it, it was a weird hurdle for me. It's not, mm-hmm. like you said, it's not a very common thing to hear about eating bugs. I mean, you go down maybe into like South America and stuff and maybe it's still kind of prevalent down there but um yeah we just don't hear about it or see it up here and so people make a big deal about it um I don't know what was your first experience with cricket protein um well I, I will never forget the day that the one or two pounds of cricket flour arrived at my door and it it really is just ground into a fine flour so um it was really easy to easy for me. It, it, funny enough, last year was the first time I had a whole cricket, and I was in Vietnam, um, like <laughs> grilled just grill like a massive one, just grilled with other chilies and spices. And I even was a little like, "This is weird. I eat these every day, like <laughs> out of the fridge." But it was so different to get that visual. 
And I get to really relate to people when we're doing demos, they, they just kind of come up to the table and inspect it. They're looking for legs. They're looking for everything. <laughs> well, and the fact that you keep that, I think um, why people end up trying them is that you don't see the cricket, right? And yes. um, I just try to remind people, like, it's ground up. Any textural thing is not the crickets themselves. It's the nuts and seeds that, you're, that are also in the bar. So, um, yeah, you know, this is our way to baby steps. Like it won't be very appetizing if you just stuck a bunch of cr- whole crickets in there. So it's it's purposeful the way we've gone about it. <laughs> um, did it. Did you find, um, was it crunchy when you had the whole cricket? I'm just curious now you got to like share more about this story. Like did it yeah. taste crickety or like was it masked by like the spices that you had it with? Was it crunchy? Like what? Don't say yeah. it tastes like chicken either, because like <laughs> no. no, you know what? It, they they were good because they were you know fried in a lot of oil and chilies and garlic. So anything is really that good. It will be good. Um, they were bigger than I expected, um, but they were tasty. I could there was definitely the notes underneath that I was like, okay, I can taste like the cricket. But now I know what I'm looking for. Um, but also on that same um, dinner that evening, we also had scorpion. So that one really stands wow. out. Yeah, because that was an experience that was bigger. There was definitely more um, textures going on and flavors that stand out. The crickets were like nothing. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I don't know if I could do that. Like just thinking about it, I guess for me, like with the crickets, what I think about is in um, when I was growing up, my like nanny's kids had lizards uh, oh, yeah. like little anoles, like lizards. I don't know if that's what they're called. But anyways, that's what I remember them being called. Mm-hmm. And like we would go to the pet shop and get crickets and then feed them to the lizards. And so I think that's where my apprehension comes from is like I'm I'm used to feeding something else yeah. <laughs> with crickets, which mm-hmm. is fine. Like, I mean, it's fine now. I mean, I love it. You guys have totally changed my whole opinion of cricket protein. Um and it's delicious, but yeah, it's just, it's kind of a, a mind trip when you get down to it. Totally. And that happens for actually not so many people are as hesitant as they were when we first started sampling our products. I think now because uh, people are hearing more and more about it, there's definitely a buzz going on about edible insects, whether you're they're hearing about it on other podcasts or CBC or, or news segments, like, you know, the peony had it, for example, on burgers. So there was that, right. way, um, you know, that targeted a lot, a, a big audience of different people that probably wouldn't have normally have considered it something to, to eat. So yeah, I think the more that um, sustainability gets put out there, and the more that health products are changing. Um, we kind of have to go with it. And like you said, like when you guys started out, even things like Maca was hard to find, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's it's kind of one of those things where I think as times change and as we grow more aware about what our food is doing to the environment and so forth, we're just going to have to kind of jive with it as well. Mm-hmm. Um I wanted to ask you while we were on the topic of tasting crickets, what mm. you would describe the taste of cricket to be? I feel like it t- tastes differently. Um, well, it depends what you're pairing it with, but like on its own, it definitely is a bit nutty and toasty and to me kind of mushroomy. Mm. Um, other and savory, like it's kind of salty and savory, really. Other people who have <laughs> really good, I, would, I want to say good palates, have told me like meaty, like it tastes meaty. And I guess that ties into like the savory notes. But yeah, it it um, it can pair well with complimentary, complimentary flavors. And, and that's what we found really with our peanut butter bar, for example, because peanuts are kind of savory. You can only get peanut satay. It kind of reminds me of that. Um, right. A bit, bit of sweetness. So yeah, I think overall... Yeah, nutty and mushroomy. Nutty mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I probably have to agree with on like with you on that, especially in the chocolate. And I think you're right in saying that like it changes with what you're pairing it with. It, mm-hmm. Let's uh, it's like wine. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you know, a good wine is gonna change taste. But with the vanilla, um, we've been trying that one lately, and mm-hmm. I find that it is definitely. <sighs> I don't know. I think it kind of tastes more earthy in the sense, like kind of more like hemp hearty. Yeah. Um, and 
probably in relation to the pumpkin seeds that it's mixed with. Um, but then the chocolate one I found kind of tastes more like, yeah, like chaga mushrooms mm -hmm. uh, mixed with like flax or something. Yeah. And you know what? You're, re you're really on point with actually earthy is, is a great description. It, that's, it really does taste earthy and like hemp, like you mentioned, like I find in our cranberry bar, actually um, the earthiness from the hemp and the cricket kind of, kind of work. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of flavors happening and some people can pick it up and like, that's great. Uh, you totally nailed it. Um, but yeah, it's re it's really interesting what people how people perceive it. Yeah, well, like I said, I like it. I'm sold on it, awesome. um, <laughs> especially for the nutritional side of it too. Mm -hmm. So, can you just go into a little bit more about the nutrition um, aspect of it? It's really high in protein, and you obviously know far more about it. But can yeah. you just lay it out for everybody here? Sure. Yeah. So. Um, I really dislike this word superfood, but I really feel like crickets kind of fall in that category <laughs> because just from yeah. the macronutrient profile, it has 60% protein by volume and a good dose of fat and carbs. So it really is well-rounded. And then when you like dive in and look at the micronutrients, it's high in iron, high in calcium, um, has the nine essential amino acids, has a great, or sorry, perfect omega six to three ratio of three to one high in B12 and even like magnesium, for example, magnesium in our cranberry bar is over 40% of your daily value in like one bar. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. All the, yeah, that is pretty amazing the nutritional profile. So it, that's why I say like it's, it is a superfood because it kind of hits all those targets and, um, yeah, we're just, it's just, it's just one of those, like, like I said, like the sustainability, the sustainability aspect and the nutrition aspect, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, just before we switch over to the sustainability aspect mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest things for me is that Avery is allergic to almost every good source of like calcium and mm. every good source of like omega threes, mm -hmm. uh, like fish and dairy and oh, wow. eggs and like all of those things. So iron too, like coming from eggs and all of these things that, mm -hmm. you know, so luckily he grew out of his shellfish allergy this year and crickets were on the plate for it. And I'm super yeah. stoked because like getting good omega threes from um, a non-plant source base mm -hmm. has been really, really difficult because he's also allergic to like nuts and stuff as well. Right. So it's like everything that he's allergic to, like the cricket just kind of came in and is now this like winning, oh, <laughs> he's <great>. winning. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's pretty amazing that all of those things are in there and we're mostly like a lot of us are deficient in these minerals anyways, totally. and some of the vitamins, right? So yeah. that's pretty amazing. Um, so can you share a little bit more about the sustainability side of crickets and maybe like, I don't know what your take is on this, but, um, maybe explain to our vegetarian friends, um, the benefits of this protein being added into their diet if it's a like have you heard of vegetarians using cricket protein and that kind of thing i'm just super mm. curious about that yeah um so in terms of sustainability so when we compare uh, crickets versus cows for per pound of protein um crickets use a hundred times less emissions so less co2 CO2, 2,000 times less water, and 12 times less feed. So across the board, they're using less resources, um, which is which is great when you look at you know soil erosion and space and feed and whatnot. Um, in terms of vegetarians and vegans, I mean that is a, a real big gray area. Where there's tons of vegetarians who have no qualms about about trying a bar or being a regular customer. Uh, even some vegans too. It really just comes down to personal preference. Um, it's interesting, especially talking to vegetarians or vegans who are vegan based on sustainability as like their core value. Um, they mm -hmm. are very receptive. Uh, sorry receptive to this idea that like this is like I've been waiting for something like this. This is like the reason why um, you know I've switched to a plant based diet because of the demands that um, conventional proteins 
have an impact on on the land and whatnot. So, yeah. And then, like, in nutritional aspect, like, B12, I know, is can be challenging for a lot of vegetarians, vegans in particular. So uh, that is a talking point that I tell people. I'm like, you know, this is a great source of B12, very high in B12. So if this is something that you're lacking, um, that could also help you. Awesome. Um, so kind of talking more about where the crickets are grown and how they're grown. Um, Cause that's going to come up, especially for people I think who are looking at sustainability um, in the sense that they're looking for something that is going to cut down on, you know, like you said, emissions and uh, maybe resources that are used. So like water and feed and all of that stuff. So how are they grown and where are they grown? I guess is the next question mm-hmm. I have. Yeah. And that's, one of the first questions people ask us is, pardon me, where are the where do the crickets come from? And yeah, I'm very proud to say Ontario. They come from mm. Ontario. They're Canadian crickets. I think a lot of people expect us to buy them overseas because um, you know they're readily available over there. And you know what? Right. We could we could because they're much cheaper, but we specifically choose not to. We are very happy with our supplier. We want to support our um, Canadian farmers as well. So yeah, so there is cricket farmers in Ontario and what they have done actually is converted their chicken farms into cricket farms. So oh, wow. they have a couple of them now and I know they're expanding quite quickly, but basically um Crickets are a naturally swarming species. They like being together and in, in the dark. And what they've developed here, our suppliers, is called a cricket condo. So kind of imagine, you know, um, when you get a six pack of beer, you know, those the, <laughs> the cardboard um, dividers inside. That's what it reminds me of. Of you know, okay, the- yeah, 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 kind of like that. So there's these cricket condos that are that where the crickets are allowed to move about and kind of it replicates this their natural world so they can hop um from different feed stations and you know they and i believe um there 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 is different life cycles so like one farm has you know the younger crickets where there's the um, older crickets in a different farm uh because the life cycle is really about six to seven weeks so it's quite short but um, this environment is, is supposed to replicate their natural environment. So, um, and then there is an ecosystem going on there. There's like spiders on the walls and they thrive off of um, everything else that's going on there. And then, you know, they even use some of the um, cricket access, excess, pardon me, for um, soil and compost. So it's really, there's a lot going on and it's everything's used. And one of our guys actually went and checked out the um, facilities and he was beyond impressed and they are passionate environmentalists there that want to make sure that the crickets are being well cared for and treated as humanely as possible. Yeah, I'm looking at a picture right now and it's kind of like, I don't know, there's different farms, I guess, but like this Mm -hmm. one that I'm seeing is like, I don't know, it kind of looks like a honeycomb of cardboard, like you were saying. And so they're like all kind of over, that's really interesting. Um, so this is going to be my next question and it yeah. <laughs> is just because I'm super curious is how then you said that their life cycle is four to six weeks. How yeah. then do they, I don't want to say kill the crickets, but like, how does it go from cricket farm to cricket flower? Right. So, um, <laughs> their, li- their life cycle is six to s- about around six weeks. So right before they're uh, mature and um, they are just frozen with a little bit of CO2, essentially, after like flushing and everything else they have to do uh, beforehand. But they're quickly just given a little CO2 and um, and that's it. And that's it. Yep. And then then they're they're dehydrated, I guess, and ground up. Yeah. So I actually receive it already uh, roasted and ground up in a flower. So um, the farmers do everything from... A to Z, basically. I get it as a finished flower. Right. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> it is. These are really, these are really interesting, like pictures. I'm just checking them all out, and <laughs> um, yeah, I really encourage uh, the listeners to go and check this out. It's really neat. Um, 
What other questions did I have for you that, sorry, I got distracted with the pictures. Um, (laughs) Super cool. Uh, There's videos Um, too. You have to check them out. Yeah. Sustainability. Yeah. Sustainability is a huge thing for me. So I, I just dug in as soon as like I read a couple things about the sustainability and never actually looked into the process of any of it. I just, uh, and so now listening to it now, I'm super intrigued. Um, so on to our next question. Um, <clears throat> so we said that, um, can you tell me as a nutritionist kind of some of the struggles that you've had or business challenges that you've had, um, maybe coming into a market where people aren't necessarily as receptive or anything else that has come up for you guys? Yeah, um, there's definitely have been a lot of challenges. Because I'm in the R&D side of things, a lot of my challenges focus around operations and uh, recipe development and scaling up. And um, with my nutrition background, I, you know, we really wanted to select ingredients that were great quality, essentially. And it's really mm-hmm. easy to kind of slip into this uh, black hole of using ingredients that are readily available on the market and cheap, right? So when we first right. started, we kind of had a laundry list of things we didn't want. Um, for example, we didn't want to use almonds or dates because they're very water intensive. Um, but then when you look at all the bars out there, you see every bar has almonds and, has almonds and dates. And, <laughs> and it's like, oh, I wonder why. It's because they're very um, mild tasting. So they, they go, they pair well with a lot of flavors. They um, blend nicely into a paste. You know, there's not as many off flavors. So uh, it was really challenging. Oh, I knew and we all knew we wanted a bar that was made with real ingredients. So that wasn't um, a worry. It was just finding ingredients that aligned with us. So pardon me, that has been challenging. I think one of the biggest ones is also scaling up. So for a while, I think I mentioned earlier how I was just doing a lot of prototypes in my own kitchen. And the thing is your kitchen environment and the scale you're using is so different from when you Mm -hmm. – scale up to a bigger production, even if it's only 10 times bigger, things change. It's pretty incredible how ingredients interact with each other and how they change. Like it's, it really is chemistry. You can, you can add nuts at the beginning of the recipe versus the end and you got a different product. you got a different product in, in, right. in flavor and in texture. And what was difficult is I didn't really know what I was looking for. So when I was making them in my own kitchen, it was great. I had to roll in my rolling pan, pan them down in a baking sheet, pop them in the freezer. It's like, okay, that is way too many steps for it to be <laughs> scalable. And then once you start increasing the quantities, things just went awry. And um, it's something we have to deal with with every recipe. But now I, I kind of got a better idea. Now I know like what the end product should feel like. Like I know what the dough, um, what type of texture the dough should be to know that it's going to hold in a package. Like you can, you know, you can give your friends and family anything, um, any bars, you know, serve on a plate with some saran wrap. It's totally different when you're in a retailer and you have to have um, a food safe product. <laughs> uh, right. So, um, that was really challenging, especially because I didn't have any um, academic experience in food science. It was mainly just my own um, tinkering around in the kitchen, my own experience. So that was tough, but I did, you know, we did hire a consultant to help us to make sure that I was on the right path. But that was one of the the biggest challenges for sure, challenges for um, for me and in, in product development. And I think Dylan would also agree, one that we're finding right now and have been for the last little while is just cash flow. It's um, mm-hmm. really tough as a startup company. And I'm sure every other entrepreneur out there would say that it's really hard to manage um, how much money is coming in and how much you're spending because you're always spending way more. <laughs> so um, It feels like that, doesn't it? <laughs> it? It really does. So you just have to be, and what, what ends up happening is you have to be more efficient and you have to be smarter, you know, work smarter and not harder. And um, yeah, we're just, we're learning that there, there was definitely been, oh, we've learned things the hard way, but everybody does. <laughs> 
So, yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that was probably the two biggest challenges um, we have right now. And like I said, the operations and scaling up is something we'll always have to deal with and cash flow. Um, I'm just, I just think we'll, we'll be getting better at it as time goes on. Yeah, for sure. And you guys have a pretty great little facility. So you're no longer working in your kitchen at home. You have no. a facility, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which must be much nicer than having to make everything in your kitchen. But yeah, I mean, in my kitchen, I was only doing like sample, like prototypes. We had to rent out um, a shared commercial kitchen. But now, like you said, we have our own warehouse that kind of um, doubles as a warehouse and a kitchen where we make our protein powders and even an office. So three ways. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And how many, do you want to like share how many people are working with you now on this and, and all of that, just share how amazing and uh, plentiful your company has been over the last, how long did you guys say you have been in business? Um, in tw end of 2015, um, but then we didn't really start selling. We took a year and a bit to do R and D. So we started selling, uh, in 2017. Yeah. So it's only 2017. Yeah. And you, you guys are in what did I see on Facebook the other day? Was it 80 stores now? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Which is a phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. People are always like, wow, it seems like you're doing so awesome. I'm like, yeah, I guess we are. It's, it's those little stats that you kind of forget. And, um, and then you're reminded, you're like, holy smokes. Yeah, we are doing pretty good. Like it's, it's obviously people are liking it, which is great. We obviously want the product to be <laughs> selling. It proves that, you know, we are a viable company, which, you know, keeps us trucking along. Um, but yeah, it, 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 I will still remember the the day that we were selling the little bars in one store and I took a photo and I was like, well, we sold our first caddy of like 10 bars. And now, <laughs> you know, we're delivering um, once a week at least and being in 80 plus stores and not just in BC anymore. Like we have one, uh, well, up north in BC, all the way up in Mackenzie, we have a retailer, which is amazing. Then we have some retailers amazing. now in Ontario. Um, so, and we're just getting started on Amazon. So things are really coming together and you know we couldn't do it without um our team which consists of the four co-founders um so dylan chris johnny and myself and then we have a full-time salesperson so um yeah you know it's a definitely a collective effort and it requires a lot of communication and patience and creativity and you know we're figuring out so we just have to keep on um, keep on this path and hopefully we'll get a lot of people um, more enthusiastic. They, a lot of people already are, but about edible insects and like I said, kind of normalizing that concept. Yeah, I think you guys are doing a great job of it. I mean, I remember when Cricket products started coming to BC and um, – yeah, I think it's really blossomed, I guess is the best way to say it over the last couple of years. And uh, I just have to say that for our listeners, I think the biggest takeaway when we're in business is that, like you said, like we have to remember the little things and how far we've come from where we started. And I think we do often forget that. And and it's, I don't know, I like to think that I'm going to write little reminders to myself about all the amazing things that people are doing and try and look back at it a year, you know, past mm. and see where you guys have been. Like you said, like starting off with like one little box that you sold and now mm. you guys are in 80 retailers and it's not that long since you guys really started. So yeah, kudos to you guys, yeah. really. Thank you. And I totally agree. We really do need to in any aspect of our lives is, 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 is celebrate those successes because I feel like right now they just kind of come and go and it's like, oh, that was great. What's the next thing we have to worry about? You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stop and be like, this is really cool. You know, we've had really yeah. cool experiences and people wanting to hear our story. Um, so, yeah, even just talking to you about this is like, wow, you're right. We do have 80, <laughs> 80 retail. Yeah. So I agree. It Definitely need to um, celebrate those. Yeah, it takes. I think it takes like somebody. Yeah, so Jesse, I have the same experience in my business where like somebody will be like, will you come and like teach uh, 20 people about this? And I'll be like, yeah. And then I'll go home and I'll be like, tomorrow I get to teach 20 people about nutrition. I was like, 
that's amazing. Yeah. And it's it doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're going through school, you're like, yes, I'm working towards this. And then when you get there, it's it's an achievement, but it's never, like you said, you kind of forget and you never really sit and like enjoy it in that moment. And yeah. I think that is a really important thing um, within business for sure. And then also being tied to a community that can hear these little like success stories um, about different nutritionists that are going out there and like rocking it in whatever capacity that it is. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that people kind of forget is that <clears throat> we all think that we have to go into business to be a practitioner, but I think you've proven pretty clearly that uh, you stepped outside of that envelope and found something a little bit more, um, I don't know, I was trying to think of a funny pun, but I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> a little bit more meaty in a way, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I really like that, uh, you know, you're kind of changing the thoughts and processes of uh, what we can do with our nutrition degree. Like it doesn't just have to be, you know, practicing mm -hmm. and consulting. It, it yeah. can be whatever we want it to be. And I think that's really important. Yeah. And you know what? I didn't really, I kind of knew right away that I didn't want to do much consulting. I just felt like it wasn't me. I wanted to be more hands-on. I kind of like being behind the scenes, which I kind of feel like I'm doing now. And I'm merging my, um, passion for food and creativity and recipes with something um, I really care about, which is also nutrition. So it's cool. I feel very fortunate. I feel like I was in the right place at the right time. And I'm lucky that um, I have this opportunity to kind of ex explore that. But you're right. Just because, you know, you have a nutrition degree, it's not limiting. You know, you can do so much with it. And I think the more people um, w like crave and want to be educated, the more possibilities there are for us. So it's an exciting time. Definitely. It is an exciting time. I feel like nutrition is just getting to the point where it's going to be a um, much bigger focus on people um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, before we end the podcast, is there anything else that you would like to leave our listeners with? Um, what can I say? I just have to share our tagline. I think it's amazing. And I want to give kudos to our guys who thought of it. But uh, <laughs> the next big thing in protein is little. Oh, I like that. That is us. And you know what? Awesome. It doesn't, yeah, it can take it for what it is. But no, I'm just uh, really um, grateful for this conversation and that there's a community of people who, you know, are striving to be better in, you know, and are health focused. And um, I'm really happy to have spoke to you and continue this relationship because I think it's great that we need to support everybody. And no matter what kind of industry you're in, we have the same challenges, we have the same successes, and we just need to be there for everybody. So thank you so much for listening to me and blabber on. <laughs> Every it was lovely. It was lovely. Um, and where can people find you if they're interested in checking out your products? Um, so if you're in the lower mainland, we have a lot of retailers, mainly in Vancouver, um, you know, in downtown along Broadway there, um, the best bet would be going on to our website, www.coastprotein.com, which you would find our retail list as well as you can purchase online. And then, um, of course, following us on um, Instagram at Coast Protein or on Facebook, then we have updates on where we're doing demos. If you just want to come by and try a little protein powder or a bar before fully committing. Um, we do demos probably once a week or so. And so we can keep you updated on that. And yeah, you can um, just look out for us. We're, we're trying to create a buzz here. So <laughs> well, I should say too, like on the website, because we did this at first too, is that we bought mm. the little packages of protein. So the single serve yeah. packages, which, which were really amazing. So we did that. And I just have to say to all the listeners too, that Stephanie always leaves a little love note in your orders. Online. <laughs> so I've got like 10 of the little love notes on my yeah. fridge. <laughs> they're, just, <laughs> they're just on my fridge at the moment. Um, I've been oh. handing them out to the mailman and other rando people who ask me, obviously the 
mailman was questioning my cricket protein <laughs> purchases. But um, yeah. that's awesome. I'm really happy that you enjoy them because when I, I always write them, and I'm like, I wonder if people just toss them in the garbage or what? Because whenever I order, order anything online, I love when I get a little note. <laughs> yeah, I love them. At I least I know them. one person appreciates. I do. And then the stickers we've given to our son to put on his skateboard too. So nice. yeah, awesome. just hitting the all it. friends. Um, yeah, all right. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, well, on that note, um, I just want to say thanks for joining me again. And I really right. hope that uh, we can have you on again, maybe to talk about uh, some more challenges and interesting mm. facts that may come up in the future. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks. I really cool. appreciate it. No problem. And again, it was really um, great talking to you. So thank you so much for having me. And this concludes episode six of the Holistic Nutrition Hub podcast. If you enjoy the show, please support us by subscribing and leaving us an awesome review on iTunes. To access the show notes, go to holisticnutritionhub.ca slash blog slash P for podcast 006. That's it for today. Until next time, take care.